Hello and welcome. There's a window of opportunity for America's new president as he's being seen as a departure from the neocon administration of President George W. Bush. Barack Obama pinned his election campaign on hope and change, which is what many people around the world are looking for in America's foreign policy. President Obama inherits a Middle East recovering from the shock of Israel's deadly assault on Gaza, but he also has the shadow of America's relationship with Iran to manage. During his bid for the presidency, Mr. Obama indicated a strong willingness to engage in dialogue with Tehran, in stark contrast to his predecessor, who placed Iran in the axis of evil. When Israel attacked Gaza, Iran was initially encouraging the Muslim world to rise up and fight on behalf of the trapped Palestinians, but then quickly subdued that call, possibly in the interest of leaving a window open for President Obama to initiate talks. What support would the U.S. leader get for engaging a country that called America the Great Satan? In the enigmatic case of Iran, it's hard to tell. It'll certainly be a challenge for the diplomatic team the president's putting together, including his choice for Middle East envoy, the veteran negotiator, former Senator George Mitchell, who gained a lot of respect for his handling of the peace process in Northern Ireland and recognizes the challenge ahead. I don't underestimate the difficulty of this assignment. The situation in the Middle East is volatile, complex, and dangerous. But the president and the Secretary of State have made it clear that danger and difficulty cannot cause the United States to turn away. On today's show, we ask, what are the prospects for America to thaw relations with Iran, and what impact could that have in a bid for a more stable Middle East? Remember, you can join our co conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE, enter the chat room and take part, and we'll be taking a poll there during the show. Well, joining me to discuss this issue, we're joined by Amal Saad Ghuraib, a leading expert on Hezbollah, one of the Muslim groups in the Middle East supported by Iran. It's fought with Israel and has been condemned by the U.S. Amal teaches at the Lebanese American University. We're also joined by the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk, and uh, he's joining us here in the studio in Washington, D.C. Good to have you both with us. Ambassador, um, you have just spent some time with uh, President Obama, George Mitchell, and the others uh, involved in, in the latest sort of um, lineup of diplomatic uh, stars who are going to be doing his, uh, his work in the Middle East. What, what message do you get, did you get about the commitment that President Obama has for change in the Middle East? Uh, well, I was in the State Department uh, Benjamin Franklin room when he made the, that announcement of George Mitchell's, uh, or it's actually Secretary of State who made the announcement, but Obama then spoke himself about uh, the peace process and the Gaza situation. And I think the most important thing that came out of that was the appointment of this senior uh, politician and diplomat, George Mitchell, and his mandate, which was very clearly stated by the Secretary, George Mitchell, and then the President himself, that this was going to be different because this was going to be sustained, engaged, persistent diplomacy to achieve the objective of a comprehensive peace. But George Mitchell did say, you know, he was, he was looking for a sustained effort to try to achieve that two-state solution. Many would say there's not much of uh, Palestinian land left to, to build a state with. The Gaza's in ruins and well, the West Bank's I, fragmented. I think that at a time when a lot of people are calling for a different answer, a one-state solution, we even had in the New York Times this morning, the Libyan leader doing that. Uh, what President Obama has done is to reaffirm his commitment to achieving a two-state solution. And one of the interesting things about George Mitchell is that he's responsible for the Mitchell recommendations this, that were designed to try to end the Intifada back in 2000, 2001. I was still the U.S. Ambassador to Israel when he was working on that. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who came up and he said, on the one side, Palestinians have to stop the violence and the terrorism and dismantle the infrastructure of terror. On the other side, the Israelis have to freeze all settlement activity, including natural growth. And I believe that we will see in George Mitchell pursuing those two critical elements in the building blocks for refurbishing hope in a two-state solution. Well, let's bring in uh, Amal Saad Ghraib here from Beirut. Uh, good to have you with us as well. And I just want to start off by getting your take on the, the uh, choice of Middle East envoy, George Mitchell. What do you think he brings to the table? Well, obviously, he brings a wealth of experience with him, um, given his role in resolving the uh, conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, of course, the conflict be. between the Palestinians and Israelis of a, is of a vastly different nature. Uh, it is not merely a political conflict or a strategic one or even an ideological one. It's an existential conflict for both sides. And therefore, I think as well-meaning as um, George Mitchell is and as Obama is in selecting him, 
um, I think it's going to be a formidable task for any one individual or even any one administration to resolve this conflict while taking account of uh, the concerns of, of both sides. It is really probably one of the most intractable conflicts uh, in, in, in contemporary times. Will it make a difference, Amal, that uh, he has a Secretary of State who's going to the region uh, and, and is, apart from uh, her sort of pr uh, previous record as First Lady, uh, that she also is a woman? Is that going to make any difference to those in the Middle East? Well, after the experience Middle, Eastern ha Middle Easterners have had with Siptini Livni, um, who was considered uh, one of the main architects of Israel's uh, terrorist policies against Palestinian children and Palestinian civilians, I doubt that's going to make much difference. Then in terms of how uh, uh, President Obama might also engage with Iran, of course, Iran uh, has strong ties to groups in the region and uh, the U.S. has always pointed its finger at Iran. What steps do you think the U.S. administration might uh, uh, now enact to, uh, to try and engage with Iran? Is there a prospect of dialogue? There certainly is, and I think there always has been. Iran is open to dialogue with the U.S., uh, so long as that dialogue does not have any uh, preconditions which require Iran to basically stop being Iran. You know, if the preconditions are as they have been for Iran to halt in, uh, uranium enrichment, to give up its regional allies like Hezbollah and Hamas, then that's basically asking Iran uh, to become a moderate Arab regime or a moderate, in this case, Iranian regime. And there is no way that Iran is going to turn itself into uh, uh, what it was before the Islamic Revolution. It's not going to go back to the Shah's era and become uh, what is widely seen and how it sees itself uh, as, as a U.S. tool. Iran does not see it as strategically beneficial uh, to become a U.S. Uh, a US ally or satellite state. Ambassador, um, of course, uh, the, the shadow of Iran has always been uh, one excuse that Israel has used for its position there, so surrounded by enemies, it always says. What would, how would Israel react, in your opinion, to U.S. engagement with Iran? Well, first of all, uh, President Obama has a mandate from the American people to engage with Iran. He made it very clear that this was what he was going to do uh, during the election campaign, uh, and he'd also made it clear that he would offer to negotiate uh, with Iran without preconditions, which is different from the Bush administration approach. Now, uh, the Israelis certainly, as we now know, were looking at taking military action uh, against Iran's nuclear facilities. They were blocked from doing so uh, by the Bush administration, by the Pentagon, in fact, that didn't want another war on its hands. And so now they are looking at, the, at, at the, a new administration that's committed to engaging with Iran. And I, my sense is, having just been there, that uh, they are hopeful that it can work, that through diplomatic engagement, uh, President Obama can succeed in heading off Iran's nuclear uh, program or the disturbing parts of it. Um, but I also think that, that their calculation is that if he tries and fails, that then other options will become more legitimate. Well, the voice of protest that came out loudest uh, when, when Israel went into Gaza was, uh, it was initially from Iran and then later subdued. What Do you think that was that uh, creating a window of opportunity, trying not to alienate the U.S.? Is that the reason why Iran might have held back a bit? Uh, no, it's an interesting uh, proposition. I, it's very hard to read Iranian intentions. It's quite an opaque system. So I can't really tell. But uh, President Ahmadinejad has made clear that he's interested in engaging uh, with the United States. And it's actually quite a different uh, signal that's coming out of Iran about this than in the past. For, for the first two, what, 27 years, the Iranians did not want to talk to the United States. It's been the position of every administration since the revolution, except for the George W. Bush administration, that we were ready for an official dialogue with, the, with Iran. They didn't want an official dialogue with the great Satan. That position has changed. They've now legitimized a negotiation between the ambassadors in Iraq. And I think that Ahmadinejad, in advance of the elections, might actually want to be the hero of a, at least an opening engagement with the United States because it's popular at home, and he knows that. Now, I wonder, Amal, if uh, you think that um, Iran is willing to, to make compromises uh, in order to do a deal with the U.S., and whether or not those compromises might include 
cut, cutting its ties, for example, with Hezbollah, any ties it has with Hamas? No, I think that's, uh, that's highly unlikely. First of all, I, I beg to differ um, with Mr. Indik. I recall that uh, Ahmadinejad wrote a letter to George Bush not very long ago, uh, just as he wrote a letter to Obama. So those uh, feelers were being sent out, actually, before the uh, nomination of Obama as president in the U.S. The problem has always been, for Iran, that the dialogue that the U.S. ever intended of having with it was one not based on equal terms. It was not one based on uh, viewing Iran as an equal partner, but rather as a rogue state that should be, uh, the, uh, the only way of dealing with such a rogue state was to dangle carrots and sticks in front of it, and which was seen as very humiliating to the Iranians. And I can safely say here that the overwhelming majority of Iranians, whether or not they support the Islamic system, as nationalists, reject that kind of humiliating treatment. So any dialogue would have to take into account the fact that Iran is the United States' is equal and that Iran is a formidable power in the region and there can be no advancement in the region without Iran's support. Now, as for would Iran be willing to give up its regional allies, uh, I think this is close to impossible, really, uh, especially if the U.S. administration continues, if the Obama administration continues along the same lines in its regional policy as that of its predecessors. Basically, if the U.S. continues to act as a regional, regional hegemon, then there is no way um, Iran would see it either ideologically or strategically fit to give up its allies, okay. supporting what Iran considers the oppressed in the world, supporting the Palestinians, fighting Zionism, are enshrined in the Iranian uh, constitution. For Iran to give up its allies in the absence of a change in U.S. foreign policy would be tantamount to the Iranian Republic defying its own raison d'etre. Okay, we're going to ask you both to stay here and take a short break. Now, more, more of our discussion in a moment. As we pause, let me d remind you, you can join the conversation by logging on to livestation.com and entering the chat room. We're about to take a poll in that chat room. We're asking the question, does Iran have the right to pursue its nuclear program? You can see there's a debate taking place there right now. We'll be right back. Da, da, da. 